All right. Um, so I like to give you a little bit of context. Um, so TESO got funding from the government of Alberta uh, to do this research project. Um, and they subcontracted Asad Norquest to do this work. So uh, this is an ATESOL's uh, initiative. Um, so I like to thank our founder and sponsor. Um, and I also like to thank uh, research participants. They were all ATESOL members. Um, so we, uh, without your help, uh, we couldn't do this. So thank you very much for your help. Um, so this is my game plan for today's session. I'm going to talk about uh, project objectives and then project scope and process and where we are at right now, and then talk about research design and findings and our data analysis. Um, so at the end, I will give you the floor um, opportunity to share your thoughts and experience teaching cultural information and intercultural communication. So um, I am very excited to hear uh, from uh, colleagues across the, ca uh, the nation to see what kind of things that you guys are doing or if you have any suggestions in terms of um, teaching this topic in ESL. So um, I have three objectives for um, this project. So ATESO wanted to research current practice in intercultural communicative competence in Alberta. So they basically wanted to know what's going on in the actual classrooms. So what kind of things do teachers do to teach culture or cultural information? So what kind of uh, strengths do we have? Uh, what kind of resources do we have and teachers use? And lastly, what kind of needs that need to be addressed? Um, so based on the research findings, we hosted um, uh, two consultation sessions to share findings and receive feedback. And the last one is to create a project report and recommendations. Um, so here's the process and the scope. So we designed uh, this research involving the ATSO board, especially the uh, president at the time, Dorta Weber. Um, and we went through ethics, uh, we got ethics approval from Red Deer College uh, because Norquest doesn't have um, in-house ethics board anymore. So we have this partnership with Red Deer College. Um, after the approval, uh, we started collecting data, so we did some interviews as well as an online survey uh, involving the ATSO members and then analyze the data, drafted findings, and then hosted consultation sessions. So one of them took place during the ATSO conference at the end of October in Edmonton. And then shortly after that, we hosted another session online. Uh, and now we are creating the final report and all the findings and report uh, will be posted on ATSO's website with links to Tutela and Rural Roads website. Um, so I'm going to talk about our research design now. Uh, we decided to employ interdisciplinary mixed method, so interview and a survey. Uh, so we use survey data to find patterns uh, and also interview data to understand reasons and context um, and whatnot that you can't really get from survey. And all the questions are designed around this document, um, ATSO Adult ESL framework. Um, um, so I know some of the uh, you guys are um, participating from Alberta and also beyond, but can I quickly ask you if you're familiar with this document in the chat box, maybe quickly yes or no? Yes, okay. Great. Oh, Krista, thank you. Okay. Then look at it. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the question was that have you seen this document uh, before? ATSO Adult Curriculum Framework. So, texture number seven is about intercultural communicative competence. Yeah, so thank you for your responses. So we designed 
and our questions around this document. So this uh, was created by um, ATESO and it's based on the Massachusetts love, uh, model of intercultural communicative competence um, adapted to our Alberta context. Um, so this is how we structured our interview questions. So uh, it starts with demographics. So, you know, in what kind of a context do you teach ESL, full-time, part-time? Are you located in urban centers or rural communities? How long have you taught ESL? That kind of questions. And then section number two is about this uh, intercultural communicative competence, seven strands. So in that document, there are seven strands. So for each of the seven strands, we ask, so what do you do to teach this one? Any um, examples, any resources that you use, and all that kind of questions. And then we asked about support that they have or they want, challenges that they face when they teach culture and communication, what kind of PD do you want, or what kind of resources do you want, and do you have any questions in general or comments. Uh, so this is how we structured interview questions. So uh, we were hoping to get as many as 10 interviews done. Uh, invitations were sent by telephone or emails. Um, and uh, I, as a researcher, asked for feedback on interview questions so that we can make um, adjustments to the online survey questions. Uh, online survey took place a little bit later uh, than the uh, interviews. And interviews were recorded for note taking purposes. And then interviews were transcribed and coded using this online software called Deduce. Um, so this is how um, online survey was structured. Um, so again, you know, we have some Alberta participants. Can I quickly ask you if you have uh, if you had the opportunity to take the online survey? Maybe quickly yes or no in your chat box, please. Yes, thank you. Hmm. Don't remember, <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so the question is that uh, we sent out an online survey to ATSO members. So um, if you are an ATSO member, um, did you uh, have a chance to do this survey? Yes or no is my question. Okay. Yeah, not a member. Yeah, so uh, you may not be a member outside this province. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so some of you have taken the online survey. Yeah, so thank you very much for that. So this is how online survey was structured. Okay, yeah, thank you for it. Um, is it possible to see the survey? Yes, um, if you can connect with me offline, I, I can definitely uh, share that with you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so, um, as for the online survey, we were aiming to get as many responses as possible. Uh, I learned that uh, we have about 550 ATSO members, so we wanted to get as many answers as possible so that, you know, all of your, all of the members' um, you know, input was well represented. Uh, two email invitations were sent by ATSO business manager. Online survey was created using Fluid surveys and data was exported as Excel files for analysis. So I'm going to talk about findings and um, I'm going to talk in this order. So first I will talk about research participants um, and then we'll talk about those seven strands. So there are seven strands and what strand is taught the most and also the least. For each of the strand, what do teachers do or use, and also what instructors think their teachers do or use, and why. And lastly, as for the strand that's taught the least, you know, what are the reasons? So we'll talk about those items. Uh, so we were aiming to get uh, as many as 10 interviews. Um, so we contacted 50 people and of the 15, eight of them um, agreed to uh, do the interviews. So of the eight people, seven were from urban centers, one was from a rural community, 
and from the seven from urban centers, four were coordinators and three were instructors, and one from the rural community was a coordinator. And as for the uh, online survey, 91 people attempted and 49 people actually completed the survey. So the completion rate is 54%. Like I said earlier, uh, we have about 550 um, ATSL members. And according to the uh, business manager, 91 attempt isn't too bad, uh, given uh, not many people take online surveys. Um, so as for the 49 people completed the online survey, uh, 42 of them were instructors and seven were coordinators. Uh, so this um, study was designed around the document. Again, ATSO Adult ESL curriculum framework, section number seven of intercultural communicative competence. So the very first question was, the, are you familiar with this document? You know, I asked you the same question, um, and here's what we got. So only one of the seven coordinators said that uh, was uh, familiar with this, so only 14%. And as for instructors, uh, only 19% of the instructors said that they are familiar with this. So we can say that this document is not really utilized by a lot of ATSL members. Okay, so there are seven strands in this document, and what you see here is a super simplified version. Um, I had to remove a lot of examples and um, explanations so that um, everything will fit in one page. So I'm going to give you um, about a minute so that you can quickly read through this, and I'll come back. Okay, so did you have a chance to quickly read through this? Okay, great, thank you. Great. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about what they actually look like in detail, um, in detail soon, um, but this is what the seven strands look like. All right, so here's what we found out. So what strands are told? Um, so instructors, said in their survey that they teach strand number four the most, uh, strand number one the second most, and strand number two the least. And interestingly, there was this alignment between instructors' answers and also uh, coordinators' answers. Um, so what are uh, number four and one look like? Uh, we will look at those in detail in the next slide. So again, this is strand number four, um, identify culturally determined behavior patterns. So some of the examples are small talk, nonverbal communication, taboos, telephone, uh, ways to express emotions, uh, eye contact. So a nonverbal uh, body language type things, as well as use of time and space. An example instructional practice is role plays. So this is what you see in the document, uh, but is that uh, what teachers do? Uh, so this is the answers that we got. So instructors said that they do discussion the most, and then role play, reading, writing, grammar exercise, and some other activities. And that was the same as coordinators understanding of what their teachers do. So again, discussion. Yeah, uh, so the qu uh, requester here is that can we see those strands again? So this is strand number four, okay? So a culturally determined behavior patterns, small talk, nonverbal, telephone, 
and all of these things. Uh, but the teachers reported that they do discussions the most. Then, then our next question was, so what kind of resources do you use to facilitate discussion? So these are the answers that we got. So uh, top, uh, number one is uh, students and teachers' knowledge and experience. And some other resources follow. Uh, as for coordinators, uh, either uh, we didn't get any response or one said, I don't know. Um, so then why teach strand number four? Uh, so these are some of the comments that we got from interviews and survey. Uh, so one coordinator said that uh, we've done for so many years that we pick topics that may generate uh, generates lots of uh, discussion uh, within that discussion, then we kind of deal with this indirectly. Uh, for the record, uh, this is not my typo, but uh, there was a little bit of a subject agreement, verb agreement uh, uh, thing. But you know, uh, the real conversation can be messy. Um, and the next one, uh, one instructor said that uh, we cover telephone protocol because they have to have a voice message. They have to be easily recognizable to employers, so they have to speak clearly, succinctly, so that when employers phone, that they can easily be gotten a hold of. So this instructor teaches um, a workplace-related bridging program, so a telephone protocol. Uh, is related to student employment. Um, and also, um, so the coordinator said that that generates topics. So uh, discussions, for discussions, you need, um, you need topics that generate lots of discussions. Uh, so maybe strand number four is told the most. And also maybe there are more employment uh, related uh, things, you know, surrounding strand number four. So that might be why strand of four is told the most. So let's move on to strand number two, uh, strand number one, which is told the second most. So this one is about uh, analyzing everyday behaviors in Canadian cultures and compare and contrast these with their own. So example behaviors are greetings, farewells, daily routines, eating, personal hygiene, shopping, and dating. An example instructional practice is observe, discuss, and reflect on cultural norms in video clips of everyday behaviors. So that's what we see in the document and what do teachers actually do? So these are the answers that we got. So again, discussions uh, that was reported to be taught the most and that was the same as coordinators understanding of what their teachers do. And then some other other activities follow. Uh, and then resources. So again, to facilitate discussions, what teach what do teachers use? Um, just strand number four uh, to teach strand number one. Uh, instructors reported uh, that they use their own knowledge and experience as well as their students' knowledge and experience. And then some other resources, uh, materials were listed. So now, uh, the reasons why uh, strand number one is taught the most. Uh, one coordinator said that this kind of thing comes up all the time. And another instructor said that I had one of the employers write to me to say that the person I sent was smelling body odor and could I deal with it. I say to my group, look, I'm doing you a favor because nobody will ever tell you about this and they'll just avoid you and you'll be the first one on the line to be let go from work. So like the issues related to uh, random one come up. So either coordinators or um, instructors address these issues and that's how strand number one is taught. So now we are moving to strand number two, uh, which was reported to be taught the least. So strand number two is about recognizing cultural stereotypes, favorable and discriminatory, and describes how they impact their own and others' behaviors. 
Um, examples are race, gender, ethnicity, religion, class, nationality, rural, urban, sexual orientation, and age. And some of the example practice is to have a discussion. So what do teachers do? Um, sorry, uh, what, why do teachers not teach strand number two? Um, here are some of the comments that we got. Uh, we don't have any, any outcomes linked to this. Or uh, it's more of the, something like a code contact standpoint. Another instructor said, we're the only culture that doesn't really define itself on paper. We can read about culture all over the world, but when it comes to Canadian culture, it's very nebulous. Another one said, I do not teach that, teach this, uh, as that would presume the teacher is to know it all. So uh, there are a couple of reasons here. Maybe it's outcome related. Maybe it's not about the topic that you would uh, bring to your classroom. Or maybe uh, some of the instructors are not um, comfortable teaching this topic or maybe as a teacher, or maybe there's no resources uh, to use, um, so don't really know what the Canadian culture is. So these are some of the comments that we got about strand number two. So I'd like to move on to the data analysis. Um, so in order to analyze the data that we got, uh, we decided to take this approach of looking at the perception gaps between instructors and coordinators. So in particular, I'm going to talk about challenges and needs. Uh, and then we'll talk about perception that you have and also your uh, behavior or action in your classrooms and also influence on your practice in terms of uh, teaching uh, intercultural communicative competence. All right, so the first perception gap is about challenges. So uh, coordinators uh, said that uh, their instructor challenge in terms of teaching culture and cultural information is confidence. Um, and one comment that we have here is that instructors have no formal training. So if they have training, uh, they will gain confidence um, and they will teach in their classrooms more. Instructors, on the other hand, said that their challenges are being too busy or not having materials to teach intercultural stuff, or there's no outcomes uh, or uh, curriculum linked to teaching cultural information. Uh, one instructor commented that nobody here gives me any directions or guidelines on any of it like there never has been. So, these are the things that we found out about challenges uh, and perception gap. The next one is about needs. So what kind of needs do teachers have? Uh, so coordinators seem to think that, that the teacher needs are having more workshops or discussion groups or professional reading. So again, they can learn and gain some knowledge and that will enable them to teach uh, culture and intercultural communication. And one coordinator commented uh, and said that I think that teachers will really want hands-on practical ideas. So with those ideas, they can uh, teach this. Um, again, it was a little bit different from the uh, teacher's side. Uh, they uh, said that they want existing lesson plans so they can print and go and teach the most. And then they wanted to have guest speakers, so somebody who knows this area really well to come in and talk. And also they wanted more of a coordinator support to make those arrangements. And one instructor in particular said that uh, uh, he or she wanted a PD that will allow a curriculum coordinator to embed this into our old already full curriculum. So. Uh, the expectation is that the instructors uh, receive some kind of support from the coordinators and so everything will be set up for them and ready to go and teach it. 
Next, we'll look at uh, perception, behavior, and influence on practice. So first item is time and resources. So by looking at the data, we realize that there's this perception that the teachers are too busy. And the behavior reported is that teachers um, use existing materials you know, uh, that are ready to go. Um, so the actual influence of practice is that in terms of teaching cultural information or intercultural communicative uh, competence, there's no time to alter or create their own resources. Um, one instructor reported that uh, there's no, never enough time. Uh, but what's interesting is that this uh, coordinator said that I wouldn't say that teachers are too busy because at the, end of the, at the end of the day, that's our focus is to try to get our students engaged into our program. So again, uh, there is this gap uh, between teachers and uh, coordinators. Uh, next item is about core content and themes and topics. Um, so it seems like the perception um, is that the uh, core content in ESL is the language and literacy. So basic literacy such as reading and writing. Uh, and reported behavior um, is that uh, teachers teach themes or topics. So let's say, you know, next week we have Canada Day, so let's talk about Canada type of thing. So the uh, practice in the ESL classroom is that um, this kind of intercultural communicative competence or cultural information is taught as a theme or topic, but there's uncertain linkage to curriculum or outcome. So there might be no curriculum or outcome linked to this. Uh, one coordinator said that I think teachers complain that because students themselves are hoping to have a language learning. So a lot of focuses are in language learning. Another coordinator said that they feel it takes away from their core, integrates something that isn't completely necessary. So again, the core is language or literacy itself. Um, so um, the cultural uh, stuff is something extra away from the core. Uh, and other instructor said, I teach theme based. So again, when you teach maybe culture stuff, it's more about the theme. So this theme's, this week's theme is Canada. So let's talk about Canada type of thing. Okay. Um, and um, next one is about buy-in. So um, I noticed that there, oh, we have some comments uh, about this part um, and I, I appreciate your um, thoughts and ideas here. So maybe we'll uh, uh, talk about that later uh, when we have um, the time to share that out. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, this one is about buying. So perception seems to be that uh, maybe a buying is difficult. Another one is that ICC, intercultural communicative competence, doesn't quite meet learner needs, and their needs are basic language and literacy. Um, and also from the data, we um, learned that the behavior um, is that instructors um, accommodate learner needs, so uh, which are basic language and literacy. So the learners come to teachers and say that, oh, uh, teacher, we need more grammar. And it sounds like uh, a lot of teachers accommodate uh, learner needs. Um, so in terms of teaching ICC, uh, the practice is instructors are a little bit reluctant to teach. Uh, some of the uh, comments here uh, gives us a little bit of context. Um, one coordinator said that uh, the dilemma is how do you get your students to buy into it? How do I explain that, yes, English might help you help them get the job, but it's intercultural that's going to help them keep it. Um, and another instructor said, the challenge is attitude. 
And um, related to that, another coordinator said that when you know when you're teaching adults, it's very hard to install a change. You have students who are very adamant and do not want to create any kind of change. So um, maybe the attitude towards what ESL lessons should look like, maybe coming from uh, you know certain cultures and countries, maybe you know good English lesson might look like you know. Um, cramming all the great points. So maybe learning about culture is not the core. So, you know, changing that attitude or you know, view towards culture stuff might be a challenge for instructors. Or maybe, um, yeah, learning about culture itself might be, you know, adapting to the Canadian culture itself might be a challenge. Um, and the last one, this comment came from a coordinator that, uh, you know, instructors have been teaching the same text in the same way for 25 years and are resistant to doing something new. So um, there might be a resistance and challenge from the teacher's end, maybe uh, from the coordinator's perspective. So uh, the next one, the last item is about PD. So what kind of PD do you want? Uh, so the perception is that teachers need more information from workshops, peers, and readings to integrate ICC into curriculum. So this perception is coming from the coordinator's end. Um, uh, but reported teachers' behavior is that, you know, they want less than co uh, coordinator support. So what's really happening in an ESL classroom, classrooms, uh, there is a uh, limited implementation of ICC. Uh, these are some of the comments. One coordinator said that, um, I guess, easy practical ideas that can easily integrate into their curriculum will be helpful. This is a, per, a coordinator perspective. Another one said, they would really need to see the value of why they should take time to do this or why they should weave it through their curriculum practice. Uh, the, their current practice. So this coordinator is talking about, I guess, um, about having their instructors understand the value of teaching um, this uh, area of uh, intercultural stuff. Uh, this instructor said that PD that will allow a curriculum coordinator to input this into our already full curriculum is the kind of PD that uh, this person works as an instructor for their coordinators. And another instructor said that there needs to be a way more concrete teaching on cultural dimensions. So again, maybe something concrete uh, for instructors to teach uh, uh, is what uh, this instructor wants. So there are different uh, expectations uh, and hopes and needs uh, around PD, as you can see. All right, so uh, we got about 20 minutes left. So I like to uh, give you the floor to um, share and provide us feedback on this topic. Um, so uh, questions that I have here for you here are, you know, what is your ICC practice uh, like in your program? I mean, you know, I, I said that in Alberta we have this adult ESL curriculum framework, section number seven in particular is about ICC. So in your province, in your program, you know, do you have any documents like that? Or do you have any curriculum, you know, um, that's, you know, built on those documents? Or, you know, what is your actual classroom practice like? Uh, I like to hear that. Um, and also by hearing, um, you know, my, uh, research, I, I, I wonder if you saw any similarities or differences when you compare your practice to our findings. And last question is that do you have any suggestions for ESL programming across Canada? So, um, yeah, any suggestions? So, um, Carol, I, I guess um, I'm the only one with a microphone and everybody else participate using that button. Yes, that's right. So everyone else can just type in their questions. 
And we had a couple of questions okay. already. Um, one of them was uh, the mm. first one was pretty straightforward. It was uh, she wanted to know if you could see, if we could see the uh, survey that you actually did. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and I don't know if you yes. could if you have a link to that or if you could post it onto Tela or something like that. Yeah, um, so I believe we can share the document. Um, so if you, um, at the end of the uh, slide, uh, you will see my email address. So if you could connect with me online, and uh, I believe I can share the document with you. Great. Okay, great. So thank, thank you. For you. That question. And um, Yasmin was asking about with when you were talking about Strand 2, and she was saying, um, could the outcome be raising awareness? Probably have to backtrack in your notes there. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? Please? Sorry, the question was it was about strand two, and could you could the outcome be raising awareness? I think okay, one of the right. instructors had said that there was um, there was no outcomes based on right. it, or one of the coordinators had. So, yeah, that that's a great question. And uh, before I answer that question, maybe can I ask? the participants here to uh, maybe um, share some thoughts on that. Okay, so I'm going to read this. Uh, Krista says that I think most of us who are instructors in the link, in, uh, in the link program are lucky in the sense that the cultural awareness is inherent in the materials that we use. Yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for that. Uh, one thing I didn't uh, mention is that when we uh, uh, asked for uh, research participants, we um, kind of limited this to uh, provin a provincially funded ESL program coordinators and instructors. And that was because A, this uh, project was funded provincially, and two, also, you know, uh, a federally founded program such as LINK has uh, their own um, curriculum and whatnot, and it's more difficult uh, for ATASO to step in and influence that. So um, we asked uh, provincially funded ESL uh, program instructors and coordinators to participate in this research. And what was interesting is that sometimes some of the instructors uh, were not too sure if their programs serve federally funded or provincially funded. So that was a, another um, uh, learning for us that, you know, maybe that's, you know, the, the understanding the system might not be uh, some of the teachers focused. So thank you for that. Um, and then, uh, Nile, my learners love anything we do related to ACC and the buying is, oh, fantastic. We talk about culture shock differences and similarities among cultures in respect to diversity. Excellent. Thank you for that. Excellent. Um, and Sherry, uh, for a long time, our coordinator felt the curriculum should involve language acquisition and not intercultural communicative competence outside the need to function in the classroom and on the campus academic. Okay. So now we do incorporate intercultural competence workshops. Uh, and a class on Canadian culture. Okay, oh, excellent. So there's a shift within your program. So that's interesting. Thank you for that. And Ken said that ICC is a big part of what we do. Right, oh, Karen, yes. All right. And I believe, Karen, you teach work based related programs. And, oh, Karen, Lee, I'm sorry. Different Karen. Oh, it linked. Okay. So that's a big part of what you do. Excellent. And Anna Marie, I agree the idea of raising awareness is a good outcome, but we do also integrate program lessons on the people subjects. Right. Right. Okay. So there's an agreement on the uh, raising awareness being one of the outcomes. Okay. So yeah, that that's a uh, Great suggestion. Um, and thank you for that. And then, sorry, I'm reading here. Patricia Mosaic Vancouver redeveloped and ran a staff training on intercultural. Okay, many teachers then wish to add ICC to their teaching practice. Now we're looking at 
exactly the issues that you raise, we, I think the answer will come from collaboration with teacher coordinator to the input. Right. Yeah. So it, it's good that you are taking and thinking about this collaborative approach to this. Hmm. And okay. And then uh, Nile Nile says that you have an intercultural center in your school. That's fantastic. Excellent. And then Kay Kaylee here says that uh, this topic relates to the difference between communication and language. I see that my role as an EAL in, uh, instructor and administrator uh, relates to teaching communication, which incorporates linguistic competence, but also pragmatic such as social cultural competence, uh, strategic uh, competence, and intercultural, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if you listened to a keynote today, but uh, Paul Holmes is talking about, you know, teaching, um, in a way, culture through the language. So teaching pragmatics is the way to um, uh, teach uh, intercultural communicative competence. And um, I, I agree. And in our intercultural center, when we teach English in the workplace type courses, we take that uh, that kind of approach as well. Thank you. Uh, and then I can't see a difference between communication and language. They are interwined, right? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And then uh, this one is that the, the, I don't know how to pronounce your name, I'm sorry. The, the, is the, it Desiree? 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 Desiree. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Desiree. Uh, so, can you comment on the imply gap between coordinator awareness of instructor practice needs and actual instructor practice needs? Did this research get used to inform coordinators about the benefits of more regular feedback from their instructors? Yeah, that's a great point. And when I had a consultation session online, one of the coordinators was a little, it was, a, it was like a wake up call for this particular individual. And, you know, uh, she thought that, you know, sh she was on the same page with her instructors, but she thought maybe she shouldn't make any assumptions. I have to check with the instructors is what she says. So I think it's a great um, suggestion to, Checking with maybe uh, co uh, co it's a great idea that coordinators check in with their instructors to see how things are really going and uh, maybe uh, if there's any anything that coordinators can do to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we are getting more here. Um, uh, you can tell students who learn English in your home country from a book outside Canada. They can, they have language without ICC and it's off somehow. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Um, I got most of my education in Japan and that's where I learned English. Um, so yeah, definitely there was not a lot of pragmatics or any pragmatics focus on the language. It was more about uh, mastering the grammar structure and all that stuff. So, yeah, I I had to learn <laughs> certain pragmatics when I came here, right? Yeah, language is used for purposes, communicative ones, right? Uh, importance of the context is forgotten that we may focus on the language only rather than the broader picture of how language is being used, right? Yeah, so uh, I agree that, you know, when you teach language, uh, culture through language, so pragmatics, uh, context is really, really important. And being able to recognize and uh, use the context appropriate language um, is a skill and that sometimes needs help, right? So, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, how regular any matter of the feedback should be? Um, how regular any what manner the feedback should 
be so this uh this array's question is about between instructors and coordinators um I do not have answer for you um do, do you have any suggestions we we have lots of members here but you know in terms of communicating between coordinators and instructors do you have any suggestions or is that do you have opportunities to do that or is it a no-no in your practice Yeah, so Mari says regularly. Sorry, the question was that, you know, do I have any suggestions about regular and in what modern the feedback should be between coordinators and instructors? And in what ways? Yeah, so can um, I ask participant? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can answer that question, Desiree. What I, we do here at ISANS is um, I'm in really close communication with my instructors, and all of our curricula has uh, intercultural communication embedded in it. Some curriculum has it more than others, but but certainly everything does. And, um, you know, we communicate, if not daily, certainly weekly on, you know, what they're teaching and what's going on in the classroom and what students need. So, um, yeah, absolutely, on a, you know, very regular basis. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for that, Carol. You're and welcome. Nola also says I'll do. Okay. Yeah, so in some cases, yeah, that kind of dialogue is happening. And Maggie says, I, I do classroom observation, looking at their lesson plans, modules, and monthly meetings. Okay, so you do that. Patricia says that, Carol, you have good ICC knowledge and skill. Uh, we all need this, teachers, coordinators, and learners. So kudos to you, Carol. Um, yeah, do you have any suggestions, Carol? Well, we do a lot of professional development here at ISANS. Um, you know, most of our staff are on salary, so um, we don't have to worry about paying teachers outside of, you know, regular teaching hours, which certainly helps a lot. Um, and we do, you know, training on essential skills around CLB on a monthly or a bi-monthly basis. Um, at Manola's question, are all your instructors in the same building? No, we do have some link home study instructors who are outside of it. And, you know, for people who are outside, um, uh, the online instructors, yeah, their PD is less than the regular full-time instructors would have. Um, so there's always challenges in getting people up to the same, you know, the same baseline knowledge and information and skills. Um, so it, it's kind of an, a, 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 it's always in progress. It's always, uh, you know, something that we're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Carol. Yeah, there's more detailed questions for you. Sorry, um, what I, I don't understand what you mean by less. Oh, for the uh, for the online um, instructors, uh, you know what? I don't actually manage that program. It's one of my colleagues who manages it, so um, I can certainly ask her, and I can get back to you on Tutela. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, this is great because I I wanted to create this space to you know ask each other questions and share. Um, because you know networking is um you know one of the um one of the nicest ways to uh, uh you know learn from each other right so it's great yeah so we've been um talking a little bit about you know uh, communication between coordinators and um instructors and also a little bit about pd and how often do you communicate with each other and stuff like that. Um, any anything else that you'd like to uh, share or ask or talk about? Hmm. 
Um, so one of the uh, one of the things that I noticed from your comment is that uh, how do we get the document that you mentioned? Um, so if you go to Alberta um, ATAS website and typing um, ATSO Adult ESL Curriculum Framework, you can download this document. And section number seven is about this um, intercultural communicative competence. Fantastic. So it's free as well? Yes. Yeah, free Excellent. available. I love free. <laughs> you type that out, please. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a TESOL ESL curriculum framework. So I believe you Google this and you should be able to uh, find the document. Okay. So, oh, and Sheila, thank you for doing that for me. Excellent. You're my hero. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a question from Patricia. Usually, what do you think about the strong desire for ready uh, ICC materials? What possibilities? Um, what do you think about the strong teacher desire for ready, uh, already ready to use uh, ICC materials? What possibilities? Um, that's a great question. And as for a TESOL, that's something that uh, uh, we talk about, uh, have to, I guess we can talk about. So, um, you know, my role in this particular research project was not uh, to basically learn about, you know, what's happening and support that and make some recommendations. So um, I guess if I switch my hats to my regular job um, in about, um, uh, helping, I guess, creating resources for ESL learners and ESL teachers. Um, I guess I, I see two sides. You know, creating materials for teachers will be really helpful. Um, uh, you know, I I understand a lot of teachers are busy, so you know, have something really handy and ready to use will be uh, definitely beneficial. And also, I see maybe you know helping uh, teachers um, or teaching some t uh, teachers some skills so that they can develop their own materials or um, adapt some of the existing materials might be a skill that's more sustainable and you know um, you can I know we, we talk about you know learner um, autonomy and independence and teaching them skills that they can go out to the and you know things on their own. So maybe helping teachers learn some skills and so that they can create their own resources that might be um, useful too. I mean that that's my that's my idea uh, for now. That makes sense, Patricia. And. Uh, yeah, Karen says, I sense the teachers feel overloaded and are worried about edit responsibilities, but I feel that ICC can be regional by the classroom. Um, uh, critical incidents developed by the center are very really useful too. Templates are so useful. Right, yeah, so again, ICC is um, viewed as an extra content, so uh, you know, adding some extra work, yeah, might not be uh, might not be the way to go. So there might, yeah, we might need a different approach to this. So if anybody has suggestions before I talk about that, Yuji, we're yeah. down to about yeah. three or four minutes here. So okay. I'm wondering if we could possibly continue this conversation on Tutela. Okay. Sounds yeah, because we can we can set you up on Tutela, and then people can go in and and ask all the questions and and get even get links to the resources as well. So. 
Okay. Yeah. Sounds perfect, Carol. Yeah. So um, the last slide that I have here is my email address. So if you'd like mm -hmm. to connect with me and ask me any questions, or if you want some of the resources that we created free available, or um, any questions about the ETHO research project or ETHSO in general, uh, please connect with me. Great. Well, great. Thank yeah. you so much, Yuji, for a very informative and interesting session. Um, your research has uh, given me a lot to think about, actually. It was very, very interesting, and I'm certainly going to be looking at those resources. Mm, thank you so much, Carol, for your uh, uh, facilitation. As well, as well uh, thank you, everybody, for your time and uh, contribution to the discussion. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Yuji.